Welcome everybody to the Petaluma Museum. I'm Joe Noriel, the president. Uh, as we further explore the theory surrounding 2012, uh, it certainly seems to be a cosmic implication. You know, everything we hear about, there seems to be something about black holes or different planets coming in. So with our speaker today, we're going to look a little bit deeper into the universe and see what's out there and see what's hazardous, see what's not, and hopefully, you know, maybe dispel a few myths and maybe learn a few things. So uh, before we uh, introduce our speaker, we have a, a special person to introduce. Um, a uh, very good friend of the museum and uh, head of the Sonoma County Astronomical Society, and it's Mr. Len Nelson. Len? Okay. Good afternoon, I'm Len Nelson, President of Sonoma County Astronomical Society. We have 90 members and we meet on the second Wednesday of each month in Santa Rosa at Proctor Terrace Elementary School. And one of our claims to fame is our Striking Sparks program, where for 26 years the SEAS has awarded 266 inch reflecting telescopes to Sonoma County astronomical students, uh, Sonoma County students who have successfully competed in our annual contest. Now, a six-inch telescope doesn't mean a telescope is six inches tall. That means the mirror at the base of it is six inches in diameter. The telescope is actually about this big. It's a great instrument. This is a picture of uh, six of our winners uh, 2010 with their telescopes. The uh, contest addresses uh, students in Sonoma County in this area, Sonoma County, uh, not all of Sonoma County, but Santa Rosa, Sebastopol, Petaluma, and Byron's. And it's for students in second to eighth grade. And we also visit local schools and provide students with an in-class PowerPoint presentation. In conjunction with those, we provide uh, evening star parties at the school to show them the real night sky, not some anima animation like they're accustomed to seeing on TV or by going to a planetarium where the stars are on an artificial ceiling. All of our services are offered free. For more information, please see me after today's presentation. Or go to our website, sonomaskies.org. Uh, our local observatory is the RFO, Robert Ferguson Observatory. It's located in Sugarloaf Ridge State Park near Kenwood, just a 45 minute trip from Petaluma. It was built by, by volunteers starting around 1998 and it's the only public observatory in this area. There's a picture of it taken from the trees. We have uh, three telescopes. These roofs roll back. This reflecting, refracting telescope in this building and two large reflectors in those buildings. I will show you more. <coughs> I think I skipped something. No, I did. That's good. This is the uh, eight inch refractor that's in the dome building. Here's our robotic telescope, a 14 inch reflector, which is in another of the two buildings. And we also offer uh, night sky classes. This is our instructor, Jack Welch, does a wonderful job. And the night sky classes are offered on Tuesday. The next series of six starts on September 20th, 27, October 18, 25, and November 22 and 29. They start at 7 p.m. at the RFO. 
a series costs $75 or each class is $23. For details, rfo.org or see me after our session today. The night sky classes, here's one that's in progress and red lighting is used to allow better night vision after the class is finished so that we can see the wonders of the night sky if weather conditions allow, which generally they do once you get outside of our little Petaluma smog area here, fog area. Now finally, about our speaker, Robert Davis. Robert Davis is a software engineer by day and an amateur astronomer by night. But he's an amateur, he's an astronomy and cosmology enthusiast 24 hours a day. He grew up in Petaluma and currently resides in Santa Rosa. He started out at the Robert Ferguson Observatory in 2001 by first taking the night sky classes that I alluded to here when they were offered. In 2002, he was asked to become a, a docent if he was interested, and he enthusiastically agreed to be. This year, he has joined the board of directors for the Valley of the Moon Observatory, which runs the RFO. On public viewing nights, he is uh, most often found sharing his telescope with visitors and showing them the wonders of the universe. He presents the latest news in space exploration at docent meetings at the RFO, and he writes articles for the observatory's newsletter, Focus. And for the past three years, he has taught the moon class for the night sky classes. Without further ado, I offer you John Davis. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start by putting on my RFO docent hat for just a second and uh, tell everyone to go outside a couple minutes after 8 o'clock tonight and look up. At approximately 8.04 or so, the International Space Station will start going across our sky. So if you look in the northwest, just look up, you're going to see a bright light just kind of slowly going across the sky. Wave to the astronauts as they go by. It's a lot of fun to watch. So, when Lynn asked if there was anybody up at RFO that might be interested in sort of providing the cosmic perspective for this series, I thought, oh, that sounds like fun. And I really couldn't think of anything more cosmic than the universe. So this is sort of a condensed timeline of how we sort of think that the universe came to be the universe we know and love. And it starts here with you know, quantum fluctuations, affectionately known as the Big Bang. So you end up with a lot of energy and from that energy, you get matter, and from that matter, you get the stars and the planets and galaxies and nebulae and all that kind of fun stuff. <clears throat> but it's kind of weird. How do we get from this dark ages, where there's just a bunch of energy, to matter and creating stars? Well, Einstein showed us the way. He gave us this famous equation, E equals mc squared. And basically what this is telling us is that energy and matter are basically two sides of the same coin. You can make matter out of energy, you can get energy out of matter, and the rate of exchange is the speed of light squared. So it's kind of one of the universal ironies of all time, that in order to understand the largest thing that we know of, which is the universe itself, and granted, there are theories that we are one of many universes in the grand multiverse. We can't actually prove that theory, um, but I think we've pretty much convinced ourselves that this universe does exist. So we can talk about it. But in order to understand it, we actually need to study the smallest things we can detect or even imagine, which are the subatomic particles. And we figured out a way to do that. You take a subatomic particle, like a proton, and you suspend it in a magnetic field. You give it a little push and get it moving as close to the speed of light as you can get. And you slam it into something. And a bunch of stuff comes out. And you build a big detector to detect this stuff and then try to figure out what's going on. We call these devices particle accelerators. And I think this quote pretty much sums up... Whoops, getting ahead of myself. I hate it when that happens. So, <clears throat> the analogy of particle accelerators is often talking about a watch. 
you have a watch or a clock and you don't know how it works, so what do you do? You throw it against the wall and see what comes out. I throw it against the wall, some springs and gears come out and go, oh, that's interesting. You know, I can start to see how this thing works, but if you can really slam it in really fast and really hard, you get a lot of little bits coming out. So the more little bits you can get out of this thing, the better you can sort of reverse engineer and figure out where those bits came from and what they're doing in there. So this is a quote I wanted to share with you. Particle physics is the unbelievable in pursuit of the unimaginable. To pinpoint the smallest fragments of the universe, you have to build the biggest machine in the world. To recreate the first millionth of a second of creation, you have to focus energy on an awesome scale. And to that end, we built ourselves the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC. This thing sits in a tunnel, it's about 16.7 miles in circumference, crosses the border between Switzerland and France, so this is basically the headquarters here at CERN, and this is near Geneva, Switzerland. To give you some idea of the immensity of this thing, here is one of the experiments, one of the detectors, it's called ATLAS a toroidal LHC apparatus, so not necessarily really great at coming up with acronyms, but they call this thing ATLAS. 82 feet high, 82 feet wide, 150 feet long, more than 2,900 scientists from 172 institutions in 36 countries work on this experiment as of December 2009. So you can see it's huge. I mean, here's, here's a person compared to the size of this thing. Absolutely monstrous, monstrous machine. And quite frankly, this thing was supposed to destroy us already. They were going to fire this thing up, and by golly, we were going to be dead. But it didn't happen. But the thing is, the LHC is currently only running at 50%. And guess when it's scheduled to hit full power? <laughs> the magic year 2012. So now we're starting to hear that, oh, hey, the LHC is coming back. Yeah, we know it didn't do it before, but when it hits full power, boy, Look out, it's going to do it again. So I am not here to talk about how this thing is going to destroy us. I am here to talk about five ways in which it will not destroy us. So the first one we're going to go to is the antimatter bomb. Now antimatter bombs don't actually exist. This is just a prototype for a video game or something that I stumbled across. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about antimatter. So imagine you got a flat piece of ground, and you dig yourself a hole. You get your shovel, they got some dirt, so what do you end up with? You end up with a hole, but you also end up with a mound of dirt. So you can kind of think of this as the hole and the anti-hole. And what happens if you bring those two together? The dirt falls in the hole, you're back with smooth ground again, your hole is gone, your mound of dirt is gone, they basically annihilated each other. That's kind of what antimatter does. And we've known about antimatter for a long time. We've been creating this stuff in the labs for like over 70 years. And this is one of the ways we do it, is we slam these little particles into each other and see what flies out. But this is kind of the interesting bit. So the collision happened back here somewhere. All these particles go flying out, right? So these are the gears and springs of the watch. There's nothing, 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 and then boom! Two particles come out of here right at the same energy level, fly off in opposite directions. If you put this stuff in a magnetic field and isolate that little guy there, you end up with something like this. So you wouldn't actually see this little bit, you know, you're certainly not going to see an arrow on the track. You're not going to see anything. A collision happens and all of a sudden at a particular energy level, two particles come into being, they're in a magnetic field, they go in opposite directions, you go, aha. We've got an electron and an anti-electron, which we call a positron. They're basically the same thing, they're the same size, same mass, but they have opposite electrical charges. So that's why in the magnetic field they go in opposite directions. And if these two guys hit each other, they will self-annihilate and go off and release a lot of energy. Now antimatter can actually be used for good things, such as PET scans. So the P in PET scan is positron. If you just looked at it, it's an anti-electron. So we can use antimatter for good things, like <clears throat> medical imaging. And where would science fiction be without antimatter? <laughs> I mean, the enterprise wouldn't get anywhere. But it does undeniably have a destructive power. So it turns out that a 250 gram, which is about half a pound, of antimatter could create a 10 megaton blast. 
Now that is about 500 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near one of these things if it went off. So can the LHC actually get us there? Turns out that they can if you're willing to wait a really, really long time. So at the current rate of antimatter production, it can produce about one one thousandth of a gram every thousand years. So if you wanted 250 grams of this stuff, you're gonna to have to wait about two and a half billion years to get it. Mm -hmm. Now, this thing is not really designed to specifically be an antimatter creation device. Antimatter is just sort of you know, a byproduct of the collisions. It could be geared to do that. You might be able to make it crank out maybe, say, you know, 150 thousandths of a gram per thousand years. So it's still gonna take a long time. And the cost of creating antimatter is about five trillion dollars a gram. So if there's any world power that can afford five trillion dollars for just one gram of this stuff, I suspect that they're gonna be buying much cheaper weapons than uh, this thing can produce. So antimatter from the LHC, not to worry, don't need to lose any sleep over antimatter. So what's next? We have the Fermi paradox. So this is Enrico Fermi. He's sort of one of the forefathers of particle physics. He's sitting at the controls of a very early particle accelerator. And the story goes that he and his colleagues were having lunch one day, and they were discussing the possibilities of extraterrestrial civilizations. And they all pretty much agreed that there should be a whole lot of them out there. There's a lot of stars in our galaxy alone. We're one of billions of galaxies. Surely there are civilizations out there somewhere. And his thing is, where are they? So the Fermi paradox is basically the apparent contradiction between the high probability of extraterrestrial civilizations existing and the lack of contact with such civilizations. Turns out that our friend, the LHC, actually gives us an answer to the Fermi paradox. We can't find any evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations because they all end up winding up building themselves an LHC <laughs> that's up their planet down a black hole. Okay, that brings us to threats. Number two, the micro black hole. So let's take a minute to talk about just what is a black hole anyway. Probably pretty much all heard about a black hole. Something where gravity is so intense that light can't even escape from it. Here's some artist representations of what black hole might look like. We don't actually have any pictures like this. I wish we could get close enough to one of these things to actually photograph it in this kind of detail. We have pictures more like this. So we have these guys here. These are galaxies. And they have these tremendous jets of particles just screaming out of them. So all this sort of yellow fuzz in the background is the galaxy, and that's the core. And this is, again, a particle jet coming out of these things. And what we believe is causing this is black hole sitting at the center of the galaxy, and there's a lot of matter trying to fall into this thing. So you can imagine you're having a lovely bath, you get out and pull out the plug. The water doesn't disappear instantaneously. It's got to go down the drain. It's going to take a while. Eventually you see the water swirling around the drain and falling in. Basically the same sort of idea. There's a lot of matter falling into this thing, but it can't take it all in at one time. So what happens is magnetic fields get generated and these particles get accelerated through these magnetic fields and go shooting <coughs> off and these tremendous jets. So that's what we call an active galaxy. The black hole is actively feeding and it's spewing all this stuff out. This thing down here is a little different. This is the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And we can't actually peer into it. There's a bunch of gas and dust in the way. We can't see an optical what's going on there, but we can peer into it with infrared telescopes. And what they've been doing is they've been tracking these stars at the center. So you can see this is over a course of about nine years. They can see these stars moving and accelerating. And based on those movements, they can calculate the orbits of these things. And they are orbiting something tremendously massive right in the middle there. They can't see anything right in the middle there. Tremendous evidence of a black hole. The only thing that can fling stars around has got to be a black hole. You've got to have a tremendous amount of mass and if you have something that big that can jerk stars around and you can't see it, it's got to be a black hole. So how does this all tie into the LHC? So I'm going to go back to our old friend. If E equals mc squared, 
Now, the whole thing about a black hole is you have to get a lot of mass in a small space. And we know that energy and mass are basically the same thing, so if you can get a lot of energy in a small enough space, you can get matter come out of that energy, create a black hole. Now, a black hole is all based on its mass. It's going to have a certain amount of mass, it's going to be so big, and <clears throat> gravity just basically behaves as an amount of mass. So, if you think of the sun sitting out there, Earth is going around it. It has a certain amount of mass. If we could compress the sun down to say about a mile and a half in diameter, there would be enough mass in a small enough space that it would actually create a black hole. So what would happen to Earth? Well, we'd get dark, obviously, because the sun's not shining anymore. But other than that, it wouldn't care. The amount of mass hasn't changed. The amount of mass that the Earth feels out here has stayed the same. It's been compressed, but it hasn't changed. So black holes are not these ferocious feeding monsters going around looking to suck up everything in their path. It's just a lump of mass that has some gravity. If you happen to hit the thing, yeah, you're going to fall into it. You're going to be in trouble. But other than that, they're pretty quiet little things. They're happy to just sit there and mind their own business. So many black holes can form with energies as low as one trillion electron volts. And what that means isn't so important as the fact that the LHC can crank out 14 trillion electron volts. So, we certainly have enough E. Now what we're interested in is the mass. So we can do a little algebra, get mass on one side of the equation, E on the other, and we end up with mass is going to be energy divided by the speed of light squared. So, you know, 14 trillion electron volts, that sounds like a pretty big number. But the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. When you square that, you end up with a monstrously ginormous number. So any number, even if it's pretty big, divided by a ginormous number, is going to result in a really, really, really small number, which is the case here. The mass of a mini black hole that the LHC is capable of creating would be about next to nothing as you can get without actually being nothing. I don't even know how big a number that is. There's so many zeros in front of it. So these guys are going to be really, really small. They have next to no mass. So they're going to have next to no diameter. These things can fly through atoms without actually running into anything. Really, really, really tiny. You know, a few years back, Stephen Hawking said, hey, I've discovered a means by which black holes can actually evaporate. It's now called Hawking radiation, and based on his theories, the American Institute of Physics has this to say on the topic of black holes. The smaller the black hole, the quicker the evaporation. Well, that certainly makes intuitive sense. If you have a big puddle and a little puddle, a little puddle is going to evaporate sooner. You know, got less stuff to get rid of, it's going to go sooner by that. LHC black hole estimated to be only a billionth of a billionth of a meter across. So I kind of touched on that on our last slide. The diameter of this thing is based on its mass. Its mass is next to nothing. So <clears throat> its diameter is going to be next to nothing. One of these things, in theory, should only exist for a few billion, billion, billionths of a second. It's going to come into being and it's going to be gone. It's just going to evaporate. It's going to be nothing. Which makes sense. Again, it's got next to no mass, next to no size, it's going to evaporate in next to no time. Of course, that begs the question, what if Hawking is wrong? <laughs> could be. He's a human being after all. He could make a mistake. Well, now i got to get a little geeky on you, but hang in there. This isn't so bad. So we need to talk about the Schwarz seal radius. And I sort of talked about this a little bit already without you realizing what it is. But basically, the radius, according to the general theory of relativity, at which a body would become a black hole. So what all this gobbledygook is saying is you've got some mass, and you're shrinking it down. And as you shrink it, the gravity gets more intense. The more you shrink it, the more intense the gravity. Eventually, you're going to have so much gravity that if you were on this object and turned on a light, the photons would try to leave at 186,000 miles a second they would not be able to get away from gravity's pull. They're going to be pulled back down. Light cannot escape from the gravity. At that point, you have what we call a black hole. At that point exactly, 
the Schwarzschild radius is the radius of the object as well as the event horizon. So the event horizon is that place which you cross and you are stuck. You cannot get out. So if you had something shrink, 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 I hit a black hole, shrink, 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 shrink some more, your object inside can get smaller, but your event horizon still stays at that same place. So the examples they give here, so we have this equation, the radius is two times the, the gravitational constant times the mass of the object divided by our friend c squared. So you have something like the sun, it's at the bottom down there. If you get its radius to two and a half kilometers, which is about a mile and a half, you hit that magic point where you now have a black hole, but you could shrink the sun down to the size of you know, a volleyball, and your event horizon would still be out here at two and a half kilometers or a mile and a half. You can get close to that event horizon without falling in. If you have strong enough rocket engines, you can pull away. But once you cross over that event horizon, you cannot get out. You're stuck forever. And if anybody's interested in the gravitational constant, there's a formula. So you could, you know, write that down and go home and do the math and figure all this out if you want to make sure. <laughs> make sure I'm right. Just don't make one. <laughs> There'll be a test at the end. <laughs> So let's, let's compare some numbers. So the Earth is pretty big. There's a lot of mass there. 5.9 bazillion kilograms. So if you shrink it down to a radius of 0.9 centimeters or about 3 eighths of an inch, so we're looking at a diameter of about you know, 3 quarters of an inch, the Earth would in fact turn into a black hole. So now we know that our little micro black hole that the LHC could create is absolutely next to no mass. We saw a couple slides back that it's only going to be a billionth of a billionth of a meter in diameter. So if Hawking's wrong and this thing does not evaporate and hangs around, what's going to happen? It could potentially swallow matter. So once matter starts falling into a black hole, it will get bigger. But it's got to be a significant amount of mass to grow significantly bigger. This thing is so small, like I said, it can travel through atoms without hitting anything. So if it comes into being and gravity pulls it toward the center of the Earth, eventually it might actually run into an electron or a proton, and it would consume it. But the mass that it would gain is still next to nothing. It's still going to be smaller than nothing. The number that I found was that it might consume the mass of a grain of sand within a few billion years. Do we have to worry about black holes? No, we do not have to lose any sleep over the LHC creating a black hole. And the other thing is cosmic rays. So cosmic rays come from outer space. These are charged particles that have been accelerated in things like supernova explosions, coronal mass ejections coming off the sun. These are particles that are flying through the universe and they are coming at Earth and they hit the atmosphere and they hit particles in the atmosphere. And they do what the LHC does. Boom, particle collisions. These particles spray out. If we could actually put detectors up there in the atmosphere, big enough to detect these things, you wouldn't have to build an LHC. These guys are coming in at us at 100 times the energy levels that the LHC is even capable of producing. If these things aren't creating black holes that we're being sucked into, the LHC doesn't stand the ghost of a chance. Don't have to worry about black holes. Number three, strange matter. Well, that sounds pretty strange, doesn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> so, you know what matter is. This is matter. Matter is stuff we see, touch, interact with every day. We've talked about antimatter. You've probably heard of dark matter. So what is this stuff? Strange matter. So the matter that we know and love, stuff we interact with every day, we can see and touch, that's made up mostly of up and down quarks. And we'll get to quarks in just a second. There are six different kinds of types of quarks. One of them is called the strange quark. Now, if you end up with a combination of matter that is ups, downs, and strange, you end up with strange matter. So what are these quarks I'm going on about? So back in the day, we knew that atoms existed. We eventually discovered that atoms have a little solid nugget in the center. We call that the nucleus. And then they discovered, hey, that nucleus is actually not a solid nugget. It's made up of smaller particles. We call those protons and neutrons. As a group, they are nucleons. Then we discovered, hey, look at that. Even the nucleons are made up of smaller bits of stuff. And those we call quarks. 
So we have this little table of the elementary particles over here. And this first column is pretty much what we live with every day. We've got up and down quarks, which make up protons and neutrons. We've got electrons, we've got neutrinos. Then we have heavy versions of these things. In the land of quarks, we have this charm, the strange, the top and the bottom. Sometimes the bottom is referred to as the beautiful. So in the particle accelerators, you can create these heavier elements, and they can come with together and make different combinations of stuff. But the weird combinations are unstable. They don't last long. They decay into real stuff. <clears throat> so strange matter would be a combination of the ups, downs, and the strange. So what can we actually say about this stuff? 10 million more times dense than lead. It converts surrounding normal matter to strange matter. It's like the blob it touches something and it incorporates it, it becomes more strange matter. It could convert the Earth in 1,000 millionths of a second, and we have a better chance of creating an ice cube in a furnace <laughs> than creating this stuff with a large hadron collider. This stuff is not known to exist in the universe. It is theoretical only on paper. It does all this weird stuff, but it is only on paper that it exists, the LHC not going to be able to create this stuff. And not known to exist in the universe is very important because, once again, we have our friends the cosmic rays. The universe is nature's particle accelerator. There are probably 10 million LHC-type experiments going on somewhere in the universe every second. And we have never detected anything even remotely close to strange matter. Again, cosmic rays come to our rescue. If these guys aren't creating strange matter, the LHC does not have a ghost of a chance. We don't have to lose any sleep over being destroyed by strange matter. Now we get to the really weird stuff. <laughs> Time travel. So we took a look at this chart already, the elementary particles. There's one bit of stuff that's missing. And the reason it's missing is because it's only in theory. Theoretical physicists say, this thing got to be there somewhere. They call it the Higgs boson. And they believe that there is a mechanism that the Higgs boson is what's responsible for giving matter mass. And if it doesn't exist, something like it should. This is the holy grail of particle physics. The LHC was largely built to find this thing. Unfortunately, they're having a really hard time. <laughs> um, they're down to about, you know, like eliminated 95% of the possibility, but there's still 5% that it may exist. Yes. If the Higgs boson gives um, uh, mass, what gives the Higgs boson mass? We don't know that it has mass. We haven't found it yet. It may be a massless particle like a photon or something. Okay. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I don't know why they're having such a hard time with this guy, because I did a Google search and I found I could buy one for $9.75. <laughs> 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 they're all over the place. Um, so, how does that get us to time travel? So we have two theorists here. We have a Danish guy, Holger Beck Nielsen, and Japanese physicist Maseo Ninomiya. And these guys are of the opinion that the Higgs boson particle is so abhorrent to nature that its future will, creation will send a ripple back in time to prevent it from being created. So these guys are basically saying that if you create an experiment, and that experiment would end up creating a Higgs boson, the act of doing that will go back in time somehow and screw things up. So you couldn't do that experiment in the first place. So it's like back to the future? Back to the future. Go back and change the past? But it's kind of, you know, to me, it seems pretty odd that the Higgs boson, if it exists, it already exists. We don't have to create it. We're just trying to find it. <clears throat> so that would mean that the Higgs boson is playing hide and seek with us, and it's intelligent. And when it knows it's going to be found, it's going to throw us back to the age of the dinosaurs or something. <laughs> very, very, very strange. But, you know, any self-respecting time travel fan can tell you all you need to time travel is a flux capacitor. <laughs> So it shouldn't be that big of a deal, but we probably don't have to worry about anybody doing time travel because apparently China has banned it. <laughs> 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 
So this is really a free speech issue more than anything else. But there are a couple of guys in Hong Kong that have categorically said time travel is not possible. There are a lot of theories about time travel, but pretty much all of them say you have to travel faster than the speed of light. And you just can't do that. And these guys were doing some experiments that they thought, well, maybe there's a possibility that the photons actually are moving faster than the speed of light. But in the end, they concluded, no, photons have to obey all the laws of physics, regardless of whether you have a magic phone booth or can get that DeLorean up to 88 miles an hour. <laughs> Any other Doctor Who fans in the audience? <laughs> magic phone booth. Reminded me of a quote by Arthur C. Clarke I just had to throw him here. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So the TARDIS is not magic phone booth, it's just significantly advanced technology. So that's okay. <laughs> so, time travel. No, I'm not going to lose any sleep over time travel. Which brings us to our final and my most favorite, Satan's Stargate. So, apparently the LHC exists to disrupt the hole in the Van Allen belt that surrounds the Earth and to allow the return of the Anunnaki from the planet Nibiru in order that they can come here, corrupt the rest of the Earth, and do battle with God at Armageddon. I gotta be frank with you, I could not find any scientific evidence to say this is not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some things I can talk about, so let's do that. We can talk about the Van Allen Belt. So what is the Van Allen Belt? It's an area of high energy particles. It was discovered by this man, James Van Allen, in 1958. And there he is on the cover of Time with the probe that he sent out into space to detect this thing. And here's a good image. So this image is talking about the solar wind, but it works for the uh, Van Allen belt really nicely. So you got these charged particles coming off the sun. The yellow lines coming off the Earth over there represent the magnetic field lines. So these charged particles can interact with the magnetic field lines. And these guys here that are coming in to the north and south pole, they interact with our atmosphere and create the, the auroras. And these other guys here in the middle that create these, these donut things, these are the Van Allen belts. And they are real and they are dangerous. If you spent too long in there, the radiation would probably kill you. However, with a moderate amount of shielding and moving through them fast enough, astronauts can go from the Earth to the Moon, and if you'd like to arm wrestle me over that, you can certainly come up and talk to me after the show. <laughs> we did go to the Moon. But apparently the Anunnaki can't get through it. And somehow the LHC is going to disrupt those Van Allen belts so the Anunnaki can. So, disrupt the hole in the Van Allen belt. It doesn't actually say how it's supposed to do that. So I can't really speak to that. But there's another phrase in here that caught my attention, which is that one, to allow the return of the Anunnaki. So if you go online and start looking this stuff up, you will discover that the Anunnaki have been here before. They visit Earth about every 2,400 years. They were apparently uh, the guys that caused the flood in the Noah and the Ark story. And the Anunnaki was the giant in the David and Goliath story. So they've been here before. And they didn't need the LHC to disrupt the Van Allen belt. They're able to get through it. So it doesn't say that they won't come visit us, but I think we can let the LHC off the hook in any case, because they didn't need it before. They probably don't need it now. <laughs> but what about this planet Nibiru? What is that all about? Nibiru. It's the 12th planet. And how do they get to 12? Very strange counting system. They start with the sun. That's planet number one and the moon is planet number five. And then they get out and eventually beyond Pluto is Nibiru, the 12th planet. Now, existence is denied by NASA. Now that brings me to my favorite quote that I have ever found looking up anything along these lines. And that is, if NASA denies it, it must be true. <laughs> okay. So, this is the supposed orbit of Nibiru. Mm -hmm. So, this outer ring here is Pluto. Pluto is really, really far away from the sun. It gets down to minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of Pluto. Nibiru is going four times further away from the sun than Pluto is. It's going to get really cold. It's going to freeze. Life is going to cease to exist. Unless, of course, they have some 
phenomenal, unimaginable technology to keep themselves warm. So, you know, they're aliens, they, they might be able to do that, I don't know. Um, but the kicker is these guys say they have a picture of it approaching Earth. So the first one there in May, and the second one in September, it's obviously gotten bigger, so it's got to be coming toward us. Something that kind of caught my eye with this picture, however, is all the stars between us and it. So clearly it's not part of our solar system, because there's no stars other than our own sun in our solar system. And if there's stars between us and that object, it's got to be really, really far away. And in fact, I know what this is because Hubble gave us a great shot of this thing. Not a planet by any stretch of the imagination. It's a phenomenon called a light echo. So in the center, you can see that red guy there. That's a star that's sort of ending its life. It's starting to run out of fuel. It's becoming unstable. It's what stars do. So this thing, at some point in the past, kind of coughed and hiccup and, and fluffed off some of its outer atmosphere. So this sphere of gas and dust coming out the sun is expanding up into space. And then in 2002, sometime, it could have been 2001, don't exactly know, but it had another hiccup, and it sent out a shock wave of energy. And that shock wave of energy was moving faster than its previous shell of gas. The shock wave catches up to the gas, it excites the atoms, and they fluoresce, and give off light. So we see that light, and that's what they call the light echo. It has since faded back into obscurity. So this picture of the so-called planet is not the planet, it is this thing. So, there could be some good news in this after all. I can't say for sure that you know, my personal belief is, probably not going to happen, but I can't give you scientific evidence, but I did find this. These guys claim that Nibiru, in fact, is not a planet, but it is a planet-sized spaceship. <laughs> but here's the best part. 2012 is not the end. It is the time when the Watchers come back, the Anunnaki aboard their spaceship, Nibiru. So, Anunnaki invasion, I personally am not going to lose any sleep over it. I leave it to you to decide if you're going to lose any sleep over it. Pleasant dreams. <laughs>